cold case that turned hot again after more than 20 years. But the evidence led detectives to one of their own. These are 27 moments when corrupt cops get hit by brutal karma. Disclaimer. Meet Kawana Jenkins. This corrections officer let an inmate make a video while she was doing the most shocking thing imaginable. Kawana faced 11 charges, including five counts of violating an oath by a public officer and one count of giving an inmate a prohibited item. In the early hours of January 28, 2023, correction officers with the Fulton County Jail conducted a shakedown on the maximum security wing. They seized over a dozen weapons, contraband, and 11 phones. As officers looked through the phones, they stumbled on a video of one of their own, 36-year-old Kawana Jenkins with inmate Jamal Ward. 20-year-old Jamal was awaiting trial for a 2022 murder and facing six other charges. In another video, Kawana was seated in a chair and filmed by an unidentified inmate. His index finger disappeared into her mouth as she simulated, well, you know what. Kawana was promptly fired and placed under arrest. The only person close to her level of nastiness is Joyce Mitchell, and you'll see what I mean soon. Joyce Mitchell. She was leaving her husband and son to drive off to Mexico with an inmate. Joyce was charged with promoting prison contraband in the first degree and criminal facilitation in the fourth degree. On Saturday, June 6, 2015, correction officers in the impenetrable Clinton Correctional Facility, Denmora, New York, noticed two inmates. Richard Matt and David Sweat didn't answer during the 5.30 a.m. headcount. When officers checked them, they found pieces of clothing arranged under their sheets. All that they found was a cute note the men left behind. The men had cut holes in the steel walls of their cells with power tools and climbed through pipes and tunnels until they reached a broken open utility hole cover a block away, just like in the classic movie The Shawshank Redemption. The prison hadn't had an escape in 100 years, and these were dangerous men. Richard was serving 25 years to life for the 1997 kidnapping and murder of a 76-year-old businessman. The man had fired Richard. Richard retaliated by killing and dismembering him. David was no better. At 16, he'd already been charged twice for attempted second-degree burglary. In 2002, he upped the stakes when he shot a sheriff's deputy 15 times and ran over his body. That got him a life sentence, and he'd been behind bars since. Both men were added to the U.S. Marshal's most wanted list. Hundreds of state and local law enforcement officers worked around the clock to get both killers back before they hurt anybody else. Three weeks later, the manhunt ended with Richard dead. Tactical team from uh, Customs and Border Protection um, met up with, with Matt in the woods, challenged him, and uh, he was shot dead. David was captured in a hideout just a mile from the Canadian border. By then, the authorities had answered the one question on everybody's mind. We want to find out exactly what happened. And one of the big questions is, where did the tools come from? The day the men had made their great escape, Joyce Mitchell, an instructor in the prison's tailor shop, had checked herself into the hospital with a case of nerves. A week later, the police knew she had much to be nervous about. The 51-year-old had been very busy behind bars. She had eyes on David. She would buy him homemade food and contraband. After her shift, the two would disappear into a sewing shop storage closet for at least a half hour. Surprisingly, David wasn't the only only one she was carrying on with. Joyce had a relationship with Richard Matt, sending him risque notes and nude pictures. In time, she convinced prison officials to move David to the cell next to Richard. Before the escape, Joyce snuck in some tools for the men, hacksaw blades, two chisels, and a punch. The 51-year-old also planned to meet them at midnight and run away together to Mexico. The officers confronted Joyce with what they knew. Her husband, who also worked at the prison, took to the news supporting his wife. I just couldn't believe it. Her reaction when I looked, when I, you know, she said he was scared, they, they really, they really escaped. And that, that's why I left at that. And You've I, known her for 21 years. You looked in her eyes. Nothing seemed unusual nothing. about her she expression or her demeanor. And I said they want to talk to us that because we know them or to help out. Later on, she changed her story. You know, people need to know that 
I was only trying to save my family. Joyce claimed the men had threatened to kill her husband if she didn't help, but the police already knew she was lying. Joyce pleaded guilty. If this seems like the dumbest officer ever, trust me, it gets worse. Her replacement was stupid enough to fall for the exact same trick. Denise Prell. If the inmates at Clinton Correctional Facility thought Cupid was done with them, they were in for a big surprise. Denise was facing 25 charges, including promoting prison contraband, abuse in the third degree, and 23 counts of official misconduct. In September 2015, just three months after Joyce Mitchell helped convicted murderers Richard Matt and David Sweat break out of the maximum security state prison, 39-year-old Denise Prell was hired to replace Joyce as the new training supervisor. Joyce was already serving a seven-year sentence behind bars, and the prison hoped the notoriety she brought to the facility was behind them. But they were wrong. In September 2017, the prison was in the news with yet another love affair in the tailor shop. The prison authorities had discovered Denise was having a relationship with a former inmate, Paul Norris. Paul was serving a 20-year sentence for first-degree manslaughter. He'd been transferred to the prison in May. When they questioned the mother of two, Denise Prell, she admitted everything. Like Joyce, the two met at the tailor shop, and sparks had flown. By the following month, they were writing letters and cards to each other using the moniker Gwen Freeman. Gwendolyn was Denise's middle name, and Freeman, well, you can guess why they came up with that. Call him by the name Gwen Freeman. He says she called him that because her middle name was Gwendolyn, and Freeman was in reference to him someday becoming a free man. Denise even got him a prepaid phone and P.O. box to talk with him when she was off work. Every other week, she gave him cash and even settled a debt he had with another inmate. When Paul was transferred to Elmira Correctional Facility, Denise had visited him, and the two had held hands and kissed. The lovebirds planned to reunite when Paul was freed in 20 years. Denise was soon relieved of her job. A week later, she was behind bars in the same prison she worked in, awaiting to be arraigned. Denise pled not guilty to all the charges against her and turned down plea deals, choosing to go to court. Fast forward to a year later, a visibly nervous Denise was in a Clinton County courtroom, tearfully pleading guilty to all charges. Ms. Prowl, uh, your criminality in this matter, which you've pled guilty to, is, is difficult, if not nearly impossible, to understand. Uh, in light of what this community uh, went through. By then, Denise and her husband had divorced and he had custody of the kids. Denise claimed the affair didn't ruin her marriage, but she's not holding a torch for Paul either. But this next officer just ran out of luck and her secret affair is about to be exposed in the most humiliating way imaginable. This is Charlene O'Banion. When she got to work that morning, she had no idea the entire prison knew the nasty things that she'd gotten up to. Charlene was charged with improper activity with a person in custody. Correction officers at the Conroe Montgomery County Jail facility in Texas received a tip that a female correction officer, 33-year-old Charlene O'Banion, had been intimate with an inmate in custody. After secretly recording her phone calls, detectives discovered that the object of her her affection was 28-year-old Jacob Parker. Jacob was behind bars for possession of a firearm and resisting arrest. He also had an open warrant for theft. On December 17, 2021, the detectives confronted Charlene about her relationship with Jacob. We were notified um, of a possible improper relationship between you and uh, Jacob Parker. So. We're here for that. I just kind of want to talk to you about it and get your side of that story. Don't ask me about it. I mean, do, you, do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he's, yeah, he's in pop six. Okay. Charlene appeared shocked. The detective asked if she'd talked to him on any calls. Again, Charlene vehemently denied it. Have you talked to him on any jail phone calls or anything like that? Uh, no. Not at all? When asked where Jacob's cell block was, she squinted like it was some vague memory. And where is Jacob a trustee? I think he's in laundry. Is he in the laundry? I don't think he's at all. She quickly made up a rambling story that involved another prisoner. And where would you think that like this allegation would come from if there's like if there's nothing to it? Um, well, I had a feeling this was coming, so there was an inmate um, named Coker, Justin Coker. Okay. 
and he got out of he got out of here for I don't know what period of time and he tried to contact me on Facebook and he sent me a message and I blocked him on Facebook and um, I guess one time um, Parker was going back to Equa to use the bathroom and he was talking like at the window with me like at Equa because I was Equa he was talking through the window mm -hmm. and I guess Coker like didn't like that which I had no contact with him or anything and um, I don't know why like he went up to I don't know what was said between them but he went up to uh, Parker and said something and then Parker ended up leaving back going back to the laundry the detective indulged her, even asking her when it happened, all the while knowing he was setting her up for a trap. Okay. When, yeah. when do you think that happened? Two months ago. Okay. Is Coker back in jail? Or? He came back, but I think he, he left. I don't know if he like, got released or he's in PGC now or something like that. The detective revealed that they had phone call recordings and gave her one more chance to admit the affair. So I don't know I don't know exactly where how it started, like who it started from. Um, but I was told uh, that it was brought to somebody's attention and then we looked at jail calls. Uh, and there's jail calls between you and Parker. And all that stuff's recorded. So uh, I don't think you're being completely truthful. Well, I, I kind of know that you're not. And I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. Yeah, no. um, I'm just kind of trying to lay it out on the table for you. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of get one shot at this of being truthful. And yeah. people, perception means a lot in uh, criminal cases and internal cases. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge deal. It sways people to do uh, a myriad of different things. You know, And this is kind of your chance to to paint your own image. Seeing the writing on the wall, Charlene changed her story. I guess a few years ago, uh, we, we talked and then I ended up here and then he ended up here. I didn't know he was here or anything. It wasn't anything like that. This time, she admitted that they had known each other before she started working at the prison, but she continued to deny being intimate with him. So we all kind of talking about the nature no. Now that he's here? Oh, no, no, no. Now that he's here, no. Okay. I mean, it's never been like, like phone sex or anything like that. Like, that's not, but like, we all joke around. Like, we all make, like, you know, like, that's what she said type yeah. things, but it's never like. She quickly changed this story when the detective revealed they had heard them together. From what I'm listening to on the calls, I take it as that you've given him oral sex at some point is what no. I gathered from these calls. This time she said they had relations, but was adamant that it was long before they met in prison. No, that was like in the world, but we never like, we never dated. We just- okay. Even going as far as claiming that they'd met three years earlier through a friend. Can you kind of give me like more detail on like where y'all met and things like that? Like how, how did you come to know him and where this all happened though? We just met through friends. I don't remember where we went. Then we went to go eat somewhere. I don't know. He was with his friends. After giving them the runaround, Charlene grudgingly admitted that they talked to each other much, much more than she had let on. Okay, so y'all talk pretty regularly. When they asked her about a photograph that she'd mentioned during a call, Charlene brushed it off. I haven't listened to this, but apparently there may be some talk in the calls about what photographs. Have you given him any photographs? Mm -hmm. I gave him a photograph of his mom, which he had asked for, and of his dog, Jax. But she slipped when he asked her about Jacob's side of the story. So what do you think that he's going to say about this? I mean, same thing like life. when I told you that we had something going on, you know, a few years back, and he ended up here, and I saw him, and then, I mean, obviously, like, he already had my number first. With Charlene's new story lined up, the detective was ready to confront her with her lies. So initially you said you kind of like played it off like you hardly knew him. I mean, I, I, I just... Uh -huh. You kind of like 
stood there and thought. Oh, about right, right now, right oh, now. Oh, Parker, yeah. I think he's in pot six. But I just looked in the system. There's like almost four hundred calls. So between y'all, you see what I'm see where I'm coming from. Kind of how it would seem from my point of view. Four hundred calls worth of lies. They gave her one more chance to make an admission. Instead, Charlene claimed she had a memory sickness. I said, "We'll, we'll, we'll play." Science dementia. I always forget, like what I did yesterday. Yeah, I'm in the backyard. To knock the bacteria out, the detectives played one of the recorded calls. Hey, baby. Hey, that. Baby, guess what? What thing? I just won the blackjack game. Oh, I'm on your ass. I'm gonna clean, I need to clean that fridge out. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff to clean and get rid of before you come home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You probably got this weird swing hanging from the ceiling. Cannon's probably thinks it's a swing set. Oh, if I had that swing, you better believe I'd leave that sucker up for you. Would you really? Hell yeah. You let me put you in it? Yeah. With a gag bar and everything, I'd be mowing you down. And we look, we look out the sliding glass door. Do you have a sliding glass door that goes to the back? As Charlene heard her voice, her head fell to her hands. When the detective paused the video, they gave Charlene another chance to come clean. You can't see how that sounds from like my point of view, like a more recent thing than three years ago. No? No, I've given up. I've given up before, and that's what he was doing. But she stood by her lies and stuck to her story. The detectives weren't having it. After almost an hour of making up stories, Charlene finally admitted that she and Jacob had gotten down and dirty. Uh, I might have given up. In bad part of the how long ago was that? Uh, a few months ago. How long have you worked here? Uh, since April. Since April this year? Mm -hmm. Was he already here? He was here. Okay. Do you know how long he's been here? Oh, no. Slowly, the reality of the situation dawned on Charlene. Charlene was fired from the county jail and charged. She pleaded guilty and has been sentenced to 100 days in jail. This was not the last time an officer got down and dirty with an inmate. Our next officer even put on a show for the other inmates. We have Tina Gonzalez. She thought it would be a great idea to make love in front of other inmates. Tina was charged with carnal activity with an inmate, possession of a controlled substance in a jail and possession of a cell phone with intent to deliver it to an inmate. In December 2019, officers with the Fresno County Jail received a tip that an inmate with a cell phone was also in a relationship with 26-year-old Officer Tina Gonzalez. Tina began working as a corrections officer in 2016. A search of the inmate's cell turned up the phone. Tina was questioned about the Torrid Jailhouse affair and denied it, but a few weeks later, she resigned. If Tina thought that was the end, she was in for a surprise. The sheriff's office opened up an investigation into Tina and quickly uncovered evidence to support the allegations. In May of 2020, Tina was arrested and charged. Tina pleaded guilty to all the charges against her. At her sentencing, her defense attorney spoke on her behalf, blaming the end of her marriage for her actions. But the assistant sheriff took the stand and gave even more details about her revolting actions while she worked as a corrections officer cutting a hole in your pants to make it easier to have sex with an inmate, and having intercourse in full view of 11 other inmates is something only a depraved mind can come up with. Yep. You heard that right. Tina would cut a hole in her uniform and have intercourse in clear view of all the other prisoners. As disgusting as that sounds, that was not the worst of it. Tina even told the inmate about searches and gave him razors. Times communicated sensitive information to the inmate about individuals that were entering the inmate's pod, as well as times and places that are in times when the pod would be searched. If officers were hoping for any signs of remorse from her, they had another thing coming. Even after she was caught, Tina continued to call the inmate and boast about what she had done. They hoped the judge would give her the maximum sentence of three years, but though the judge had harsh words for Tina, I think what you did was terrible, stupid, you ruined your career, you endangered your fellow officers, 
but I also believe that people can redeem themselves. You got the rest of your life to prove that. He sentenced her to seven months behind bars and two years probation. This former corrections officer will serve her sentence at the jail she once guarded. We have Christopher Hayes, a hero turned villain with a very sick kink. Hayes was facing counts of felony false imprisonment and three counts of battery. For four years, Christopher Hayes, a former Army veteran, had worked with the San Diego Police Department as a stellar officer who served with distinction, even rescuing a woman from a fire, or so they thought. In December 2013, a woman came forward alleging that Hayes had touched and groped her inappropriately during pat-downs while he was on duty. Hayes was upset by the accusation and proclaimed his innocence to anyone who would listen, but an investigation would reveal that there were more women he had assaulted. This is now the seventh woman to come forward alleging Officer Chris Hayes abused his badge since Team 10 broke this story last week. The first six women have claimed sexual assault or battery. Not one, not two, but seven victims. They all had similar stories. We were talking and he was like, you know that I could take you to jail. I was like, but I wasn't driving the car. I didn't do anything. He's like, well, if you go down on me, I won't take you to jail. Hayes resigned, saying he felt betrayed by the department. But if Hayes thought that was the end, he had another thing coming. Days later, he was arrested and charged. With his wife standing by his side, Hayes pleaded not guilty. At his preliminary hearing in April, three victims described what Hayes had done to them. One woman told the court that Hayes pulled over at a bus stop and offered her a ride. After she entered his car, he told her that he had forgotten to pat her down. Hayes then took her to a secluded area. He does a female pat down, which was the groping of my breast and the groping of my Another victim said that Hayes had picked her up and taken her to a friend's house, where he proceeded to conduct his version of a pat-down. Then he forced her to stay with him as he made inappropriate comments. The whole thing is obscene. Should, the conversation should have never happened. He should not have been in the driveway talking to me about the color of my underwear. The third woman was drunk and arguing with her boyfriend when Hayes appeared. After handcuffing the boyfriend and sending him off with a threat, Hayes told her that she was too drunk to go home alone and he took her home. But he followed her in and ordered her to lift her shirt. So I lifted both of them and he said all the way until where um, the bottom of my breast and my nipple were exposed. Then he told her to do the most horrifying thing. He drops his hands towards his growing area and thrust his hips and says, just touch it. The terrified woman did as he said. I'm gonna get hurt if I don't listen to him. I need to get out of here. Hayes' attorney argued that the women were under the influence and their memories could be hazy, but the judge wasn't convinced, and the case was set to go to trial. Before his sentencing, one of the victims had a chance to speak to Hayes, and she did not hold back. He is a disgrace to the uniforms he has worn. Hayes' wife took the stand, saying her husband would never commit the crimes he was accused of. There are things I may never know the answer to, but what I do know is my husband would not deliberately hurt others. Hayes gave a tearful apology to his wife and his family, barely addressing what he'd done to his victims. I would like to say that I am sorry for anything I have done that has caused anyone pain. I have always tried to help people and do good so now that I have hurt someone is not something that I am very proud of. He hoped to get probation and maybe community service, but the judge pulled the rug out from under them and sentenced Hayes to a year behind bars. Hayes wiped tears as his wife burst into tears. <laughs> The former officer was put in cuffs and taken to jail. If you think that's shocking, wait till you hear what this chief of police said in court. I took the money, and mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers. But before we get to that, Marcus Eberhardt and Howard Weems. Killing a man because he's too tired to walk sounds crazy, but that's exactly what these two did. Eberhardt and Weems were charged with one count each of murder, involuntary manslaughter, and six counts of violation of oath by a public officer. On April 11th, 2014, East Police responded to a 911 call at an apartment complex. Gregory Towns Jr. was in a domestic dispute with his girlfriend. Friend. The minute he saw the police, he ran to the woods, closely followed by the police. But Towns would never come out of those woods alive. His family would find out that he'd been tased to death by the two officers in those woods. Towns had rolled down an embankment, was in handcuffs, and out of breath. Yet Eberhardt used his taser on him ten times. Total shock time of 
47 seconds. While Eames used his three times, it took over a year for both men to be indicted and charged with his death. At the trial, the defense attorneys argued Town's death had more to do with his illness and that the officers were well within their rights to use tasers. But paramedics and neighbors took the stand, testifying that Towns was already compliant and there was no need for the tasers. He did something in this case that should have never been done. And so it was important to our office to restore our confidence in our criminal justice system to let people know that if you are doing the wrong thing, that the system applies equally to everyone, to police officers as well as civilian defendants. After a day of deliberations, the jury returned with a verdict. Eberhardt was found guilty on all counts, while Weems was convicted on the lesser charges of involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct. Before the judge ruled on their sentence, Town's girlfriend Aisha Smith held her three-year-old son's hand and spoke about regretting making the 911 call. Me calling the officers that day, it made the whole situation worse. Um, you carried a lot of guilt. I carry a lot of guilt to this day. When Weems got a chance to speak, he apologized to the family, but Smith wasn't having it and lashed out in court. I do extend my condolences to the town's family. She was immediately ordered out of the courtroom and spoke to reporters. I don't want to hear anything he has to say. I just really don't want to hear anything he has to say. Um, Gregory's not here to respond for himself, so I did it for him. Eberhardt was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, and Weems was sentenced to five years. Two men's stupid actions cost another man his life. You'd think this kind of poor judgment doesn't happen often. Think again. Wait till you hear what this sheriff does to keep up with his crazy addiction. Charles Reeder. We're talking about Charles Reeder, who fancies himself some kind of Robin Hood. Reeder faced 18 charges, including first degree engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity and tampering with records. Once upon a time, Charles Reeder wore the highest ranking badge in Pine County's law enforcement when he was sheriff. A year later, he shot to nationwide fame as a horrified public followed the investigation into Ohio's worst homicide, the 2016 Roden family massacre. Eight members of the Roden family were found murdered. Two years later, they found the culprits, four members of another local family, the Wagners. Reeder's face flashed across TV screens a shining example of good police work and his no-nonsense approach to drug and gang arrests. We declared war on drugs uh, when I was appointed the sheriff in 2015. We came together with the Piketon Police Department, the Waverly Police Department to form a major drugs and crimes task force. And the reality is, after the alert that I put out, people were shocked that there was gang affiliation coming to Pike County. But something sinister lurked in the shadows of this sheriff's fame. A month later, an anonymous complaint came in about salary and benefits being collected in the sheriff's office. State officials raided the sheriff's office, and what they found was much worse than they thought. Apart from envelopes containing cash being tampered with in evidence, impounded vehicles were auctioned off at ludicrous prices, only to be resold for more than double. And the man pulling the strings was none other than the town's favorite sheriff, Charles Reeder himself. It turned out that the people's sheriff had a gambling problem and had used his office to fund the habit. He also owed deputies and a car dealer money. Reader swore he was being framed. The following year, he stepped down as sheriff and was indicted on 23 charges. He swore at the deputy who served him the papers and pleaded not guilty in court. Yes, sir, how you doing? It'd be better if you'd get my property. Understood. Yes, sir. Vowing to fight the charges against him, but a year later, Reeder pleaded guilty to five charges, including theft in office and tampering with evidence. Several people spoke on his behalf, claiming that the job pressures had gotten to him. There's no greater man than Charlie Reeder. Judge Patricia Cosgrove listened attentively as Reeder made a long and tearful plea for leniency. As a sheriff of Ohio, I should, <clears throat> excuse me. I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. I can only ask that my staff, their families, the community, and my family who is here today will forgive me for the undue stress I caused them. For this, I am terribly sorry. 
I stood in this court on September 24th and pled guilty to the charges against me to accept responsibility for my conduct. I have and I now pray that the court will find mercy on me. And I beg the court, if they see fit, to grant me community control, even with the strictest sanctions that I have proven to this court in the past two and a half years. But before he took his seat, the Cosgrove had some questions for Reader. I have a couple of questions for you. The big question uh, I have and is on everyone's mind, I'm assuming, is why did you cut open these evidence envelopes and take the money out and then in some cases you put it back, although you were caught because the envelopes had been unsealed uh, and sealed again improperly and the denominations did not match what was taken at the crime scene or from those individuals. Uh, I guess, why did you take the money? Reader tried to justify his actions, claiming he was some kind of Robin Hood. I took the money, and mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers that took it from parents of very poor people in this county. That money, regardless of what the state and what the media has claimed in the past years of a gambling problem and that money being used for gambling, was used when there was a tree planted in the name of the Shelton boy. It's at the entrance of Western High School to the left as soon as you pull in. Nobody could pay for that tree. Nobody offered to pay for that tree. A drug dealer did. But no paper trail showed Reader had supported a single cause. What you're saying here as to why you claim you use the money for various charitable community things. And then, uh, but the, the PSI officer notes that there's no documentation that you used it those things. His answers did nothing to convince Judge Cosgrove that he was remorseful, and she had little sympathy for a man who tarnished the badge and broke the public's trust. Reader's wife and kids cried as the judge sentenced him to three years behind bars. Reader was escorted out of the courthouse and taken into custody by the deputies he once led. Stealing from drug dealers is one thing, but stealing from charities? That's exactly what one sheriff did, and it's not even the worst part. Meet David Oliver. This chief of police's fall from grace to grass will give you whiplash. Oliver was charged with unauthorized use of property and unlawful restraint. Crystal Casterline, a patrol officer with the department, accused him of harassment. Brimfield's former chief of police had officially become a mope. Investigation into the lawsuit led to many officers backing her claim, but they soon found Oliver had been up to much more in office. Oliver stole money meant for charity. He also went into evidence and picked weapons, some of which he sold and others he kept for himself. Oliver pleaded guilty to the charges against him. Before sentencing, his attorney tried to paint a positive picture of his client. Mr. Oliver, as I think everybody in this room knows, uh, served the township of Brimfield first as a police officer uh, and later as a chief. He served approximately 10 years as the chief of police. Uh, as everyone knows, Brimfield is a small town that has its own small town politics. Uh, I think politics have played a role in this case. Claiming that he pleaded guilty so he wouldn't have to drag his family through court. Oliver got a chance to speak, but instead of addressing his victim, Oliver claimed it was all lies. I mean, I, I, one question, and I'm not going to be long, Your Honor, but one question I would ask is if there was a sworn police officer who thought there was a crime that had been committed in 2012, why didn't you report it? The secondary thing about this is I never heard anything about a hostile work environment or assault or... He also said the other officers were ganging up on him, but the prosecution fired right back at him, reminding the court of his heinous behavior as chief of police. Um, I would like to say that perhaps Mr. Oliver should question um, what kind of leadership skills he used with those people that they were too afraid to come forward until my office showed up to investigate. And people were more than happy to tell us about his crappy, horrible, deplorable behavior. He makes no apologies today. He has no remorse for what he put those people through. It's astounding, Your Honor. Officer Casterline finally got a chance to face the man who made her life miserable for close to two years. 
I was so eager to learn and felt so unsure about what to do at times. Looking back, I can understand the frustration and the resentment my supervisors must have felt. Many times I would be so unsure, but the chief was someone that I could trust and come to at any time with any question. And with me, he strongly encouraged me to use his open door policy. She disagreed with the plea agreement, but she made a lengthy emotional statement about what she'd been through for the past few years. I told him over and over that he was making me uncomfortable. But the physical assaults and sexual harassment continued on, on an almost daily basis for two years. I became more and more withdrawn and depressed. I truly felt there was no way out. Through Casterline's testimony, Oliver dramatically shook his head and made faces, but the judge didn't buy his act. you become the moat that you wrote about in your book. Do you realize that? She sentenced Oliver to two years of probation and ordered him to surrender his police certificate. Oliver was also fined and ordered to pay $1,304 in restitution to the charities he ripped off. And this was not the only time officers have been forced to arrest their chief. One sheriff couldn't stop getting arrested, Todd Pate. After getting a lenient sentence for a severe crime, you'd think this sheriff would be a little less arrogant. You'd be wrong. Pate faced nine charges, including first-degree assault, operating a motor vehicle, under the influence and four counts of wanton endangerment. On March 8, 2019, a 911 call came in at the Breckenridge County Sheriff's Office. The driver had fled the scene. Officers later found a damaged truck and the county sheriff, Todd Pate, in the nearby woods trying to hide beer bottles. Pate reeked of alcohol. His eyes were bloodshot. His speech was slurred and he could barely hold himself up. And this was not the first time he'd been arrested for a DUI as sheriff. Back in 2015, Pate had been arrested for DUI and reckless driving. All he got was a fine of $800. He wasn't going to get away so easy this time. Pate was charged and indicted on multiple accounts. A shocking fall from grace for a sheriff who'd once been on Oprah for his exemplary police work. Pate agreed to a plea deal that would give him a sentence of just 75 days. All he had to do was plead guilty. Easy peasy, right? But things didn't quite go as planned. In court for the hearing, Judge Janet Crocker had begun addressing the court when she noticed Pate was busy doing something else. Uh, is that your phone, Mr. Pate? Yes, it is. You need to put it away. Okay. I was just... Had a... You need to put it away. Okay. Yeah. Not a great way to kick off proceedings. Instead of pleading guilty, Pate began questioning the judge. It your desire to change your plea uh, from not guilty to guilty? Do I have to answer that yes or no, or can I make somewhat of a statement? That's that, what is, I, that is a yes or no answer, sir. Will I have the opportunity to say anything further? If you, it is your intention to change your plea from not guilty to guilty, then I will take your plea, and certainly you'll have an opportunity to make any statement that you want to make. But if it is not your intent to enter a guilty plea at this time, then I'm going to set your case for jury trial, and you're going to stop wasting my time and everybody else's time this afternoon. Ma'am, I'm not trying to waste your time. And then is it your <laughs> intention to enter a guilty plea at this time or not, sir? No. Crocker ignored Pate's tantrum and talked to the prosecuting attorney. Your Honor, we would move to revoke the defendant's bond at this time. We, had took, we took part in a lengthy mediation. We agreed to continue this case two months to enter this for you today. Uh, I think we've inconvenienced the entire court system by canceling the pretrial date. He would be taken back to jail if he didn't decide, but Crocker gave Pate another chance. Mr. Vows, would you like some additional opportunity to meet with your client this afternoon before we proceed at this time? Um, I don't believe it'd do any harm. I'll make it very, very quick. I know we've already delayed the court, and uh, I'll report back within a couple of minutes. All right, I'll give you, I'll give you another ten minutes for that. All right, thank All right, you. Thank you. Ten minutes later, the court was back in session, but Pate was still insisting on being allowed to complain about the first-degree assault charges. Can I say a few things, or...? I need to understand what it is that we're doing here like today, to Mr. Pate. Yes, I had every intention of coming in here today and entering a guilty plea based on the, um, based on the mediation that we had. Uh, it's very difficult for me to enter a guilty plea to felony-related charges that I've been in law enforcement for 25 years and never have I ever charged someone with felony charges 
on a situation pertaining to this uh, that was similar to this. And boy, did he talk. At a point, his lawyer had to butt in and explain why he should keep quiet. If I may interject, just if you intend not to enter a plea, don't say very much about the case because what you say here under oath will be used against you. But Pete continued to go on and on and on and on and on. It's difficult for me to enter a guilty plea um, for a lot of reasons. And I don't want this court to think that I am trying to minimize, take away from, or deflect any responsibility that I had in this situation that occurred. Uh, I do absolutely feel like that because of my bad decisions, this whole case took a turn that it wouldn't have taken had it not been the Breckenridge County Sheriff. Judge Crocker decided to get things back on track. I think we are back, Mr. Payton, and probably should have, have stayed in the place where we started. But this chatterbox would not take a hint and even started taking jabs at the prosecuting attorney. I think everybody in this room wants this over with. If I could address Blake. Blake, I hope you learn from this case. I'm not mad at you. I'm not in any way upset with you. Mr. Pate, not that it matters. we have reached that point now. Okay. It, this is either a yes or no. Are you going to enter your plea or not? I guess everybody thinks it's funny. Well, certainly not the people who I think are, are here with you today, I Mr. No, they don't. I've broken everybody's heart. But it's hard for me when I see Mr. Chambers sitting over there smiling. Finally, Pete agreed to plead guilty. Let me just plea and get it over with for everybody. Plea to something that I absolutely do not feel good about, but I don't want you to try to send me to the penitentiary for years and years. But the judge's patience with Pete had run out. Probably I think unusual, we're done. At this do point it. in time, I think we're done. And so let me tell you where I think we are today, is that we have executed plea documents. Whether or not Mr. Pate uh, uh, has the right to withdraw the, his plea now that he's executed those plea documents remain to be seen. Pate was taken to jail and held without bond. After spending some time in jail, Pate pleaded guilty and served his sentence of 75 days behind bars with credit to time served. Giovanni Crespo Crespo faces six charges including aggravated manslaughter and official misconduct. On the night of January 28, 2019, Gregory Griffin was pulled over for speeding. The officer reportedly told him to turn off the engine during the stop, but he didn't comply. Sir, turn off the vehicle. Turn off the vehicle, sir. Turn it off. Turn off the car and roll down the window. Open the door. Then she noticed a gun near the driver and immediately ordered him to put his hands up. Let me see your hands! Hands! Hands on the wheel! Let me see your hands! Let me see your hands! Instead, Griffin put his foot on the pedal and hightailed it out of there. Be advised, the vehicle took off. Thomas in Pennsylvania. 2017, I mean, Chrysler 300, color black. The officer radioed for backup as she followed after him. One of the officers who joined the frenzied high-speed chase was Giovanni Crespo and his partner. When the patrol car pulled close side by side with the fleeing car, Crespo jumped out of the car, brought out his gun, and fired. <laughs> not at the car's tires, but directly into the car at the men. He missed, but not for long. He hopped back into the car and they continued the chase. Shots fired on that vehicle, shots fired. He repeatedly urged his partner to drive faster. Oh, come on. At one point, his partner even told him to relax. No, 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 get in. Relax, bro. It must have been the opposite day because Crespo pulled that stun again. The third time the car came to a stop, a pumped up Crespo raced to the car. Stop! 
He barely ordered them to stop the car before he shot through the passenger side. Stop the car! Get down! Get out the car! Hitting both men in the head, killing Griffin, and severely injuring his passenger, Andrew Dixon. It should be under his leg. Does anybody fires a weapon here? No, no. Later, as more officers arrived, Crespo kept telling everyone what he'd just done over and over and over. I shot him in the head. Back up, back up, back up, back up. Get the gun. I shot both of them. I shot both. Yeah, yeah. You good? Yeah. yeah. I shot both of them here. Okay, right and here. Then, uh, After reviewing the footage, the department determined that Crespo had used excessive force. He was immediately suspended from the department and arrested. During the trial, Crespo's defense attorney argued that Crespo was a superhero. This law enforcement officer saved lives that night. End of story. But the prosecution saw the evidence differently, mainly because Crespo's story had changed. This defendant shot Gregory Griffin through the back of the head, severing his brain stem and killing him, and shooting his friend Andrew Dixon in the face, causing serious bodily injury. After six days of deliberation, the jury came back with a verdict. Crespo was found guilty on all counts. Several of Crespo's family members broke into tears. Their sobs and screams filled the courtroom. One woman began screaming in Spanish as she rushed out of the courtroom. <laughs> He's facing up to 30 years for his stupid actions in January. Speaking of stupid actions, you won't believe what this officer did to a patient just because he called him bro. But before that, Jordi Yanes Martel. Take a good look at this face because this is the last person you want to see in your nightmares. Jordi Martel faces four battery charges and one trespassing charge. In January 2020, Martel, an officer with the Miami Gardens Police Department, filed an arrest report alleging that while he was was working off-duty security at Tootsie's Cabaret, he had tased a drunk woman who refused to sit on the curb and was punching and kicking at officers. Then, months later, a video leaked, and authorities realized everything they knew about that arrest was a lie. We are all here today to correct what we all see as an injustice that we are alleging is actually a crime. It all started when 32-year-old Sofia Sacho was kicked out of Tootsie's Cabaret for throwing money at a waitress. She was trying to leave when Martel approached her. The club owner had told him to tell her to never return, but Martel had other ideas. Is there a reason why you need Yes, you're being trespassed from the location. Okay. okay. You need to follow me to my car, please? He told her she was trespassing and ordered her to step out of the car. When Satchel refused, he reached into the car, opened the door, and dragged her out and threw her on the ground. Oh, reach in my car? Is you crazy? You can't reach in my Listen, car. What are you doing? Like, no, what is he doing? I'm a, like, come on, don't be fing pulling the fing car. Like, what's wrong with you? Why the fing is he while kneeling on Satchel's neck, Martel got out his stun gun and hit her twice in the stomach. Why is you kneeing on her neck though? That's weird as Why is I kneeing on her neck though? Why is you kneeing on her neck Get back! Get back! The video was a third strike against Martel, who was already on thin ice after being seen in another video using excessive force. Barely two years after the Miami Gardens Police Department had hired him, Martel was fired and found himself facing charges of his own. The trial began with the prosecution painting a graphic picture of Martel's actions that night. The defendant, that man at that table, while holding one of her arms with his hand, puts his knee on her neck while she's on her back and her stomach is only covered by this thin piece of material, but his actions do not stop there. And pointing out the lies he used in covering up the arrest report. And just misrepresented other facts that are also necessary. <laughs> The defense fired back that Martel's knee was not on her neck and tried to blame Satchel for not cooperating. You do see this, but you are not going to see any clear indication that that neck or that that knee is actually on the neck. In fact, you're going to hear contrary evidence to that. In the end, Martel was found not guilty of the felony charges, but guilty of battery and trespassing. Before the sentence was handed down, Satchel finally faced the officer who'd attacked her. From his knee choking the life out of me, fabricating reports and lying on me, to being tased multiple times in the abdomen 
while being pregnant. I want him to suffer as much as he intended for me to suffer that night. Martel also spoke in court, but the judge was not convinced. I take full responsibility for my actions and for what happened that night. It did not only affect Ms. Sacho, it affected me as well. Martel was sentenced to 30 days in jail, and he has to spend a minimum of 100 hours speaking at the police academy about what not to do when serving as a police officer. This is Peter Delio, and his knees are licensed to kill. Delio was charged with felony battery with great bodily harm. On the night of August 12, 2014, Robert Lease was taken into a police holding cell over a $60 debt. Little did he know that by the end of the night, he'd be missing an organ as well. It all started at the underground bar in downtown Orlando, Florida. Robert had ordered 12 shots of Jack Daniels and couldn't clear his tab. He offered to wash dishes to cover the tab, but the manager refused. I mean, even a bull in a china store would do less damage than this drunk. The manager called the police. Peter Delio, an officer with the Orlando Police Department, arrived on the scene and handcuffed Lease, but he did not go peacefully. At the station, his manners didn't improve. While still in restraints, Lease headbutted the glass on a door, breaking it. An angry Delio barged into the cell and struck Lise in the stomach with his knee. Lise immediately crumpled. Delio placed him on the floor and left him there. Lise shouted for help 35 times, but the officers ignored him, talking and laughing outside the cell. An hour and a half would pass before one officer walked in asking why he was causing such a racket. When Lise was taken to the hospital, the doctors found out he had a ruptured spleen and was bleeding internally. He was brought in in the nick of time. A few minutes more, and he would be dead. Both officers were fired from the department, and that was only the beginning for Delio. He was also charged with battery. Delio pleaded not guilty and took the stand, defending his actions that day. But the video clip was much more compelling to the jury, and he was found guilty. His elderly parents took the stand and cried as they begged for leniency. Please do not let his stoic appearance lead you to believe that he is not deeply sorry for the injury that he caused Mr. Lease. We all are. He's not a cruel man. He's not, a, he's not an unjust man. He just was he was just in the wrong place at the right time. With the writing on the wall, Delio went from proclaiming his innocence to admitting he'd made a mistake. I understand why the jury made the decision they did. It's clear to me why they did. I was wrong, and I caused your injury, sir. And I am deeply sorry that I did and that you had to suffer through that. The judge invariably sentenced him to 51 months in county jail, followed by probation. Then he would complete an anger management class and pay restitution. On March 8, 2022, an auditor visited a county courthouse in Buchanan, Iowa to ask questions, explore the building, and talk with employees. Suddenly, he was accosted by a sergeant demanding for his ID. Weren't you just up there? Huh? Uh, no, I think I came from downstairs. Do you have an ID in here, sir? Uh, yeah, I do. Can I see that, please? Oh, certainly. But this cop had no idea what he was getting into. He pulled card. Oh, your, your real ID. Yeah, this is. No. After card on the officer. Right here. The D. Okay, What's that? I got the ID. Who only got angrier and angrier and finally demanded that the man leave. Time to go. Let's go. You need to leave. Excuse me? Don't touch me. But the man wasn't ready to leave yet and made it clear to the officer. What crime did I do? I'm here to get papers. Let me see it. Uh, no, you could look you right here. Excuse me? Didn't you already get your papers? I think you need to slow your roll right now. When the officer realized that the man would not meet him downstairs, he made the humiliating journey back upstairs joined by another deputy. A terse exchange followed, with both officers looking on as he thoroughly dressed them down. You work for me. No. You work for the people. Do you live in Buchanan County? It's none of your business. What's so funny, little boy? Why can't you just respect our rights? What's the First Amendment? Do you know? Didn't think so. You like the Broncos? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no, I like freedom is what I like. Apparently you guys don't. You're still free, aren't you? Uh, not by you. You want to be a little tyrant. Hey, get out Get out of the public building. I haven't. Hey, hey, he went up. Yeah, because you're not going to. And if you do, guess what? Well, have fun in court. Clearly, they had no grounds to force him to leave. But instead of letting him go, the sergeant continued to stay there, asking the man to leave. Okay. That's bad. You're I'm, poor leader. I asked you to leave. 
Unfortunately for him, the man wasn't ready to go yet. For what crime? I did nothing wrong. I literally just got a passport okay. and you're over here harassing me. For what? I'm not harassing Yes, you are. Hey, did you already go upstairs? Leave, leave. Did you you go? gotta leave. Finally, the sergeant's supervisor arrived. He turned out to at least know a thing or two about the law. The man explained everything that had happened since he'd been accosted. You want to know what happened when I came in here? Guess what? I'm being so polite to everybody. I go in here, go in the clerks. I ask them, hey, what, what services do you guys provide here? And you know what? I got, I got a passport information right here because this is what I'm looking for. I'm here to go in all these offices. And this guy right here, he should not have stripes for one. That's disgusting how you treat the public. Oh, two, he's really yelling at me. Really hold on, hold on, little man. Number two, I'm in here to check out the public building. Public. Don't forget that. The captain swiftly de-escalated the situation. Captain, is this what you, do you accept this behavior? What do you need? Well, I'm gonna go, I'm, I just got here. I'm going to each one of these buildings, asking what services they provide. I'm getting certain things, like I just got a passport info, cause I'm gonna fill it out and get a passport. And I'm here checking out the building, then I get harassed by this deputy. Well, check out the building. Exactly, why couldn't we do that in the first oh, place? Yeah. So you have no problem? No. Exactly, do you have a problem now? It, it, yeah, and he says it's fine because maybe, you know, he appreciates the Constitution. Just don't interrupt or go back into any place that you're not. Exactly, and I don't. Exactly, and I don't. The man couldn't help but take a few more digs at the sergeant and the deputy before going on his merry way, leaving the officers to lick their wounds, embarrassed and humiliated. Go home, maybe just check out the Bill of Rights because you don't thank, know it. Thank you for your advice. Yeah, no problem, and thank me for my service too because your service is not good. Nothing screams higher authority than superiors putting underlings in their place or cops getting mad because they don't know the law. What don't is it threaten name? me! Are you threatening it's not me? Gonna... But before we get to that, let's see these two blockheads conduct the shortest traffic stop in history when they realize who was behind the wheel. On June 19, 2017, a woman on her way home from teaching at a Florida law school was pulled over by two officers with the Orlando Police Department. Without saying a word, she calmly handed over her state ID. He asked what agency she worked in, and the woman replied with four words that would take his day from good to bad. What agency you were? I'm the state attorney. Same thing. All right. Very bad. Aramis Ayala was Florida's state attorney. As the officer returned the cards and repeated what she said, the implication of who he had just pulled over had dawned on him. Suddenly remembering his manners, he stuttered out as he tried to explain why they pulled her over, ending with the words, we're good now. Thank you. Your tag didn't come back. Never seen that before. Um, I'm sorry? Like yeah. We're good now. Ready to walk away. But she wasn't done yet. So it was... We ran a tag. It, I've never seen it before. A Florida tag. It's never come back to anything before. <clears throat> so that's the reason for the stop. They tried to brush it off, claiming her tag didn't come up, but she still wanted to know why they needed to search it. What was the tag run for? I'm sorry? What was the tag run for? Oh, we run tags all the time, whether it's the traffic lights and, and that sort of stuff. That's how we figure out if you know cars were stolen and that sort of thing. The officer stumbled over an explanation, but she hadn't run a traffic light and they weren't looking for a white stolen car. So he quickly brought up something about her car's tinted lens, which he couldn't even check. Also, the, the windows were really dark. I don't have a tint measure, but that's another reason for the stop. Aramis smirked and immediately asked for their cards. Do you guys have cards on you? Yeah, one second. Actually, this isn't my car, but I can write my name down if you'd like. <clears throat> In the terse silence that followed, the officer cleared his throat, gulped, and even started breathing heavily before retreating to their car. Lucky for these two officers, he wasn't in the mood to get anyone fired. Unfortunately, the next officer didn't have luck on his side. On November 13, 2019, a 17-minute video of Deputy Constable Daryl Jones accosting two shoppers in a parking lot went viral. The day before, Aaron Joseph and his cousin, Durrell Cunningham, were shopping at a Nordstrom store in Indiana when they noticed an officer staring at them. He even followed them into the parking lot and tried getting their plates. As Aaron circled back to confront the officer, Durrell turned on his camera. Immediately, the officer got out of his car and started shouting for their license and registration as soon as he was within earshot. For what? 
because I told you to. The men refused and demanded to talk to his supervisor. You haven't have a reason, sir. You didn't you didn't I'll tell, tell you me over. But Either you didn't pull the me over. Out or I'll hit for a backup and call I'll your, call your the car. Call, call your supervisor. 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 But the officer didn't reply. Instead, he threatened to call for backup. He couldn't even explain why he wanted their ID, and that's not even the worst thing he said. What do you need my ID for, sir? Well, because you you want to run your mouth to me. No, because you was looking at my license plate That's for what? Exactly. For what? You don't exactly. have the right to run this. I got my right to do right anything to I want to do. I'm a police officer. But the men were adamant. They were not giving him any information. So this pot-bellied nincompoop called for backup. You can't lock me up. Control top 3315. We're asking you to call a supervisor, sir. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, we're not getting a supervisor. We're not getting a supervisor? After a brief back and forth, the men asked why he wanted their information. This time, the officer came up with something extraordinary. I don't mind showing you my driver's license, you but driver's what license. is your reason that you're asking? Because. Why? Because you're acting suspicious. How About you what? You we, what? You we uh, was in there shopping. I said, show me your driver's what license. What is the what is the sus oh, what is the sus uh, suspicion, sir? Get your driver's license out. You can't you can't Just state show the suspicion. Show me your driver's license. That's sir, all I want to say. You're not explaining to me. You didn't pull I'm me over. To you, you jumped at your car and I'm asked me, did an I want to investigation? Wanna... What's the inve What are you investigating? Look, you can see me in there shopping. Because we spent, I paid. I paid money. I paid for everything that I bought. Get your driver's license out. Sir, Show can me your driver's license. I'm not going to argue with you no more. I'm not if arguing. I, I'm yeah. trying to understand Show something. License, the other car gets video. there. I'm going to take both of you out, show, show, and I'm going to tow your car. Can you give me your name? Your failure, your failure to d identify. I'm not. You have no reason. Your you, you, you have no reason driver. to pull me over. Show me your driver's license. You didn't even pull. You're not even behind me. You jumped out the car and told me exactly. to stop. You stopped right here. We weren't in traffic, sir. We were pulling out of a parking license, spot. Or I'm going to tow your car. You're not going you to tow, tow anything, the car, sir. You're not going to tow a car. Step it up. Call 911. I am. On my phone. When they asked him what he meant by suspicious, he couldn't explain what he meant and claimed it was for an investigation. Then the officer revealed that he was off duty, which made the stop all the more suspicious. We asked for a supervisor, you did not understand. I'm, I'm not gonna get a supervisor. I'm asking for your name. I'm off you duty employment. You're off duty? Exactly, off duty employment. The officer resorted to persuading, saying he would let everything go if he didn't find anything. If you if you don't got no warrants or nothing, you're gone. I have no problem. What, or, what is the reason you that you're stopping me? When the men told him that they wouldn't let it go, the officer threw a tantrum, screaming into the car. And if your driver's license check out, I'm, I'm going to let it go. Oh, it's not going to be let go. I don't care what. Sir, what is don't it threaten name? me. Are you threatening me? It's not going to be let go. Are you going to threaten me? You're, you're, are you why crazy? Are you, why are you got your you hand You're going to threaten the police officer? Why you got your hand on the window? I'm not scared of you. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried anything. about you either. We ain't broke no Get laws. Get your driver's license out right now. We are not I'm broke about no to, laws. sir. Can you give me your name? Get your driver's name? license out. Can, like, not can you identify yourself? Get your driver's license out. Can you identify yourself? Get your driver's license out. Can you identify yourself, sir? You see who I am? You see my badge? What's your name? What is your name? Get your driver's license. What is your name, sir? The terse exchange continued till backup arrived. Refusing to identify himself. Get your driver's license out. A civil servant. Off duty. Off duty, pulling people over at Nordstrom Park. Ain't Park. nobody pulled you over. You stop. Well, if you ain't no, pulling us over, you, you don't need to see me. no license. You jumped out and stopped no, me. No, I said, show me your driver's license. You jumped out and stopped I me. I said, show me your ID. You jumped out and stopped I'm me, sir. Argue with it's sir, not an argument. Okay, wait, we just had, wait, it's just wait. one question. What was the reason for you jumping out on us? Suspicious behavior. What, like what? Exactly. What? The officer told the backup a different version of events. You have to suspect him of doing something. Suspicious behavior. I got, these guys were inside there. They got a bunch of stuff. And uh, then they brought the mouth to me as they were leaving to try to make sure I didn't get their license plate. And then he didn't want to show me ID. Off, officer Shrillman. No, they didn't steal items. We bought a bunch of items. They bought a bunch of stuff. But... but when they were sitting right here, I was trying to get their license plate. He hollers out the window, you're not getting my plate, and he takes off. So I went to get him, then he comes back and he stops here. So I asked him for driver's license. It's all on video, that's not what happened. After the men told him what really happened, the two stepped aside. Minutes later, the officer walked past and made an angry announcement. So we didn't get your name? 
We never got your name. Hey, officer. The backup officer came around and confirmed that he had no reason to stop them. I'm his cousin. Okay. Okay. So we came in here. He bought some things for his daughter. Mm -hmm. We bought a few pairs of shoes. Sure. But the whole time, this guy is standing in there staring at us, right? Okay. You got to have some type of reason for running the plate. You're, uh, you're not necessarily. We can we can run plates for any reason okay. or no reason okay. at we'll all. Say, we'll what say he that's... does have to have is he have to have what's called reasonable suspicion in order to make a stop. On you. He has and... to have some sort of reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed. Correct. And at that point, you know that that's why I asked him. And... And that's, what suspicion that's, do you have to that, stop him? And I heard okay. you asking him that. But if Deputy Daryl Jones thought that was the end, he had another thing coming, just as they promised. We gotta upload that too. I have never, oh, it's, it's going to the news and everything. He's gonna lose his little job. The video went on YouTube, and two hours later, Deputy Daryl Jones was out of a job. A deputy constable fired after a video of his encounter with two men goes viral. If you think that's the only time a cop has tried to make up a law, think again. This officer tries to pull the same stunt. Joke's on him. These women know the law much more than he does. On February 10, 2010, two animal cruelty activists were outside a local shopping club in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, protesting the number of live pigeons shots when a car tried to run them over. The terrified women placed a 911 call, but when the officers arrived, it wasn't for them. The officer said that the club had called them to complain that the women were on their property. So we would appreciate it if you would leave. You are on private property. Supporting a long-held belief that the club was in cahoots with the Ben Salem Township Police Department. But that's another story. Officer Joseph Blickley immediately requested that they turn off the audio of their cameras. Do you have the audio on on those cameras? Yes. Okay, would you mind turning the audio um, off? Um, no, I don't need to. Okay. But the women declined. The club owner chipped in that they were on his property, but the women knew it was a public road. You understand you have every right to protest, but that you can't be on their property without their consent. Okay. You can. You can be on public property, you can be on the roadway where it does not impede traffic, but they have the right to ask you to leave the property. Okay, well, okay. is there is public access along here, so it goes to, you know, a certain point. So I think we're within that point. You are understanding that you're creating a safety hazard. Here. No, I don't think we are. Well, I am telling you that you are. Well, what basis do you have for that? Because I'm because telling you or not. You're roadway right now creating a well, safety so hazard are you. for people to come in. So are the uh, police officers. Honor, I have to be here. Well, I think we're, we're standing by the side of the road. We're not, we were not in the road. We were always within the public access area. Officer Joseph again tried to get them to turn off their cameras, this time saying it was against the law. Certainly. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to turn the audio and the cameras off because it's okay. illegal in Pennsylvania. It's not illegal. Yes, okay. it is, miss. I'm sorry. You, you it's can not illegal. Ma'am, you can videotape me, but I'm asking you not to audio tape without my consent. Okay. Can you please do that? He didn't know that one of the women was a lawyer, but he was about to find out. With that intimidation tactic shut down, he tried another angle, asking for her ID. Okay. Well, I'm not going to get into that here. Do you have identification, please? I don't on me now. She said she didn't have one, and they tried to get her name, claiming it was just to write up a report. Okay, can I have your name, address, sure. birthday, please? What do you need it for? Am I going to be arrested? When we get a call, we need to take a police report. That we get a okay. Call. That's all. I don't, am I, what do you need my ID for? Okay. Why do you need my name? We're here on a police call, we're having contact with you, and we're going to identify you and name you on our police report. The woman stood her ground. Unless she did something wrong, she didn't need to give a name. Officer Joseph argued that she had, bringing up his made-up wiretap law. Okay. Why, would, why would that be? Because I don't think I'm doing anything illegal. I don't think there's, I'm under suspicion of okay. any anything. Okay. Well, why do just, I need my name? You just told me that you're audio taping us, and I asked you not to do that under Pennsylvania wiretap laws. Okay. Okay, she... Told me she's not audio taping a video audio taping. I have no problem with that. I'm asking you the same thing. When she confronted him about the charges, he stumbled over himself as he backtracked. Okay, so you're you're gonna take me into custody because of suspicion of violation of the wiretap law? Did I ever say that? I asked for well, you asked for my ID, so I'm under suspicion for something, and you said the wiretap law. No, so what? Okay, you, but you, you said asked. the reason that you wanted my name and not hers was because of the wiretap We're law. And Val, please, please okay. keep, keep videotaping the people who come in. Okay, you asked why we need your name yeah. and your information. Did right. I ever say that I'm going to take you into custody? Well, you, you said that you needed it for the wiretap law. You said you think I'm in violation of the wiretap law. So I'm assuming that you're going to do something about that. That's why you need my name. 
but I never said I was taking you into custody. Okay, well then I don't think every, I need to give you my name. Every police call that we go on, we identify who we talk to, who called the police, who we're talking to, well, and they go in the police report. Then he went from saying she was breaking the wiretap laws to claiming that he had only politely asked that she stop filming. I kindly asked you to stop audio taping, that's all I did. Okay, you did. But she wasn't having it. Okay. Yeah, and I, I said that I understand I'm a lawyer, okay. well versed in the law, I'm, I've prosecuted cases under the federal and the Pennsylvania state wiretapping law. I know that this is le this okay. is legal. The officer continued to say that it was illegal to be audio recorded, adding that they were not on public property. I asked you to stop audio taping. Right. I said in Pennsylvania we have wiretapping laws. It's right. not legal to audio tape someone without their consent. You refused. I asked you for your information. I never said anything about taking you into custody. Okay. Again, she turned the tables on him. Do you know for a fact that right now you're on public property? Well, because we stood, I mean, now I think we're in the driveway because we're talking to you. Well, but okay. where we were standing. If you're not sure either, how could you say that we're in violation? Okay, here's Hi. what we're going to do. Okay. We cannot have you stand in the driveway here. Okay. On this side of State Road where this is plowed because they've maintained it and they don't want you on the driveway. Okay. If you want to stand on the other side of these snow banks, you can do that, okay? We're gonna find out through the township exactly where their property line is, but for right now, we're gonna ask you not to impede their traffic and not to stand in this driveway. Realizing they had no legal grounds to remove them, the officers left with their tails between their legs and the women returned to their protest. Not knowing the law is one thing, being blind and dumb is another, and for one man, an officer's dumb move gets him a huge payout. On January 29, 2021, the Westchester Police Department received a 911 call from a department store about a 30-year-old white man wearing a tan jacket who was shoplifting. Caucasian male, maybe late 30s. He's wearing a dark green slash gray type colored Carhartt coat. He's got a red hoodie underneath. Um, I believe he has a cutting device. Officers Tanner Sendes and trainer officer Tim Mantenkenba were dispatched to the store. They made their way into the store and after looking around for a bit, Officer Sendes pointed out a man who caught his eye. The trainee was confused and even mentioned to the senior officer that the man he was pointing out didn't look like the description they'd been given. Yeah. Nonetheless, like two blind mice, the two men approached the man, a black man. Even a dispatch came over the radio and told these two knuckleheads that the perp was in another part of the store, but they continued to head toward him and demanded to see what was under his jacket. Yes, uh, LP call said that you were concealing some items inside the jacket. <laughs> That man was Eric Lindsay, a 60-year-old black man, and he knew he was not their guy. What did they say? A black man did it? No, sir. Well, what did they say? Because I'm walking here after you guys. Listen, listen. This isn't tan. What am I listening to? What am I listening to? This isn't tan. Even though he pointed out that his jacket was a different color and he had come in after them, the officers continued interrogating him, even though he was clearly not their guy. Hell yeah, I got items in my jacket. Well, items that I walked in here with behind you guys. Meanwhile, the real perp continued to roam the aisles freely. Finally, the dispatch came over the line again and told them where the suspect was. This time they listened, but another officer found the guy and made the arrest. As you can see, it looked nothing like Eric, which only made him angrier, and he did not mince words with Officer Sindes. It doesn't have one, unless I have a tan jacket on and an orange hat. The police chief tried to play down the incident and made excuses, but both officers were eventually given administrative warnings and sent for retraining on field interviews. That wasn't enough for Eric. They made a mistake like that and it was truly a mistake. What kind of people are you hiring 
and given a gun to. He later sued the police department and they reached a settlement out of court. Westchester trustees agreed to pay thousands of dollars in a settlement. The city will pay $28,000 to Eric Lindsay. At least something good came out of it for Eric. This was not the only time officers made mistakes and refused to back down. Six officers were about to be humiliated on national TV when they wouldn't stop searching this guy. Tron West was driving in his car in Homewood, Pennsylvania on the afternoon of January 16, 2023, when a police cruiser suddenly pulled him over for not using his signal before making a turn. I turned my turn so no one made the left. He turned his lights on and told me the reason why he stopped me was because I didn't turn my turn signal on. But what was supposed to be a quick stop and end in a ticket or a citation took a bizarre turn as more officers pulled up. Not one, not two, not three, not four or five, but six police officers. They all converged at the traffic stop location. One officer found something, a dangerous butt of marijuana about the size of a pea lounging threateningly near the gas pedal. So they handcuffed Tron, held him to the side of the road, and began to search his vehicle. 45 minutes later, the officers were still going through the car. By then, the bizarre roadside stop had gathered a crowd of bystanders who wanted to know what was going on, what were they looking for. Tron, who was on parole for prior drug and gun violations and trying to get his life back together, couldn't risk going back in and losing everything he'd worked for, so he stood helplessly at the side and let the officers do their thing. Suddenly, a woman in a pair of PJs and a coat appeared. She marched in and took charge of the search. The woman was Kate Lovelace, an attorney who worked for underserved communities. And he said, um, what's his name? And I said, what's your name? And he said, Tehran West, and I said, Tehran West. And he asked Tehran if I was his lawyer, and I said, do you want me to be your lawyer? And Tehran said, yes. Someone had told her about the viral video, and she immediately got behind the wheel, drove straight there, and introduced herself. Mere minutes later, the officers wrapped up, and Tron was released with just a warning, thanks to one lawyer and PJs.